Good morning, Sanctuary. Thank you for joining us online, for being a flexible community as we've had to make some of these decisions on the fly. These are unusual times, but we're given an unusual opportunity to love our neighbors by some of the practices that we've had to undertake recently. So again, thank you for worshiping with us. We know this can feel a little odd, worshiping this way, but we just want to encourage you to lean into it, to recognize that we come here to honor and to worship God, that as much as we do this for ourselves and for the emotions and the feelings that we may get from our corporate worship, we're really here just to worship God. So let's pray together as we begin. Heavenly Father, you made us for yourself, and our hearts are restless until they find rest in you. Look with compassion upon the heartfelt desires of your servants. Purify our disordered affections, that we may behold your eternal glory in the face of Christ Jesus, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Let's worship together today. Make me whole, Lord. 
Good morning. This is a pastor's dream having revival here. I think there are four of us in this room, <laughs> including me. We're in the chapel, and uh, you know why we're here. We're here because we're trying to cooperate with the culture and trying to stop this virus. Talk a little bit about, more about that in a minute. Um, I have two readings this morning from the lectionary. The first one's out of Exodus 17. It says, from the wilderness of sin, the whole congregation of the Israelites journeyed by stages as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. The people quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. Moses said to them, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water, and the people complained against Moses and said, Why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and the livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, Go on ahead of the people and take some of the elders of Israel with you. Take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will be standing there in front of you on the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come out of it so that the people may drink. Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. He called the place Massa and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled and tested the Lord saying, is the Lord among us or not? And then the second reading is from John 4. It's again about water. So Jesus came to the Samaritan city called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it was that was saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where would you get the living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us the well, and with his sons and his flocks who drank from it? And Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. And the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw the water. Now, in the Old Testament reading, the lectionary for today tells us of this story. When Israel was in transit between Egypt and the Promised Land, they were in the wilderness. Most people, scholars estimate that their number was between 20 and 150,000 souls that were in transit. Imagine taking all those people camping, which is basically what they're doing out in the wilderness. There were children, elderly, healthy people, sick people and quite a logistical challenge. And at the point we enter the narrative, it says that there was no water for the people to drink. And so as you would expect, verse 2 says, the people quarreled with Moses. They said, give us water to drink. And Moses said to them, why do you quarrel with me? And then he asked them oddly, why do you test the Lord? Such an interesting charge that Moses hurls at the Israelites. You're testing the Lord. What did he mean? We find out at the end of the story, and in verse 7 in this story, he called the place Massa and Meribah because the Israelite quarreled and tested the Lord, and here's what they were saying. Here's what the test was. Is the Lord among us or not? Somehow, when people face need, when they come to places where there's trouble, where the things that they need don't seem to be present, the immediate temptation appears to be that that is evidence that God is not with us. But the promise of Scripture is that God always is with us. His promise is that he is always with us. In Psalm 46, it says, God is our refuge and our strength, an ever-present help 
in the time of need. It's so counterintuitive because we think in our minds, if God really was present and God really was helping us, we wouldn't be in trouble. We also remember this famous text from Psalm 23 and 4, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff will comfort me. Again, we think if God was really with us, we wouldn't be in this kind of valley. And that's this great test of faith. It's the choice that even when things don't look like they're working and it looks like we're abandoned, the choice of faith is to say no, irrespective of what we see, irrespective of the trouble we're facing, God is right here with us. As believers in God, which has leaps of faith in it, that's what believing means, we assert God's presence and we assert God's care even in the face of trouble. That's what our Exodus text is speaking to. So I want to talk about that a little bit this morning in just in the context of what we're addressing with this whole coronavirus and the COVID-19 challenge that's, that we're right in the face of. And let me announce this. God is with us. Jesus is still interceding for us. And uh, we will continue to have his help. He still is the Lord. And uh, even if things get dark in our context, that doesn't mean he stops being the Lord. As you know, most of you know, the mayor of Tulsa, Mayor Byram Bynum. Can I get amen, Father Paul? Amen. <laughs> Requested to yesterday that all public gatherings over 250 people should be stopped in our city. And this was a call for our city to go the extra mile for the sake of the most vulnerable among us. Um, and to blunt the spread of COVID-19 that we have moved, um, uh, why we have moved our service to going online today is precisely in response to that. Um, we're joining other communities like the Boston Methodist Church and uh, Life Church and uh, Church on the Move and some of the other churches to do this for probably at least the next two to three weeks. Um, we'll be giving you updates on that as we go along. But what's important for me is that all of us understand that are part of this community of faith, that this is not a move to say God isn't with us, nor is it a move to fear. Um, it certainly is that for some. Some people are just freaking out. Uh, but fear should never be a welcome option for believers um, in the, because we believe in a risen Christ, right? Uh, dozens and dozens of times in sacred text, the Bible commands us, fear not. But refusing fear is not an excuse for us not using common sense. You remember the text we read a few weeks ago in Matthew 4 in Jesus' temptation is often quoted and spoken from in the season of Lent. This is where the devil takes Jesus up into the holy city and stands at the highest point in the temple and tells Jesus, this is, it says in verse 6, if you are the son of God, then throw yourself down, for it is written, God will command his angels concerning you and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against stone. Here Satan is tempting Jesus to violate common sense in the name of God's protection. But violating common sense in the name of believing that God will protect you is not faith. It's, it's really foolishness and presumption. Along with all the common sense actions that we can take in a season like this when it comes to spreading a virus from washing your hands to, in social context, not hugging or shaking hands or, or you know, staying at home if you feel ill, uh, establishing social distancing uh, is, has proven to be the most important thing that we can do as a culture. And so deciding to go online is a move that's motivated to love, and because it's for the common good, not fear. I love what evangelical leader uh, Eugene Cho tweeted uh, a couple of days ago. He said, quote, when churches cancel their in-person services and go online, it's not an act of fear or panic. Rather, it's an act of care, both the church, for the church and for others, for the healthcare system, for neighbors, and for the vulnerable. This is what it means to be for the common good and to seek the peace of the city, end quote. 
The church is supposed to be a group of people that works for the good of all. Um, our calling is to, to come together and to do things together when fear makes us want to fragment and not pay attention to each other and just fend for ourselves. The problem is, is that in the history of the Western world, when plagues have hit areas of the world, the impulse wasn't always for the common good. I mean, in a plague that hit Florence, Italy in the 1300s, it was recorded that, quote, citizen avoided citizen. And when things got even more desperate and the death rate began to climb, quote, mothers and fathers were found to abandon their own children, untended, unvisited, to their own fate, end quote. The same thing happened in the 1600s when an epidemic happened in London. A person living through that time recorded this, quote, there was a time when everyone's private safety lay so near to them that they had no room to pity the distresses of others. The danger of immediate death to ourselves took away all bonds of love, all concern for one another, end quote. See, sometimes things get so bad that people act in ways that are shameful. And they, they do so because they feel like they're being forced to do so. We see this unfolding in real time in places like the doctors in Italy who have to withhold care from some suffering people around them, leaving them to, to the fate of their disease and the horror of having to make that decision they feel forced into. Through the centuries, as plagues broke out, cities felt forced to identify victims and to isolate them. And there were scores of examples in the history of the world where whole families of a community were locked up in their homes and blocked from delivery from any provisions or medical kind of supplies. As late as 1918, which isn't that long ago, 100 years, a couple of years, 102 years, the Spanish flu pandemic hit the United States, killing some six. 125,000 Americans. Just to put that in perspective, there were only 52,000 soldiers that died on the battlefield. There were more that died, but that actually died on the battlefield during World War I. So 625,000 Americans died in that flu epidemic. It lasted two years. But they, they, they called the health workers in 1918, called out to American citizens and begged for their help for volunteers to help, but the call fell on deaf ears in the United States. In Philadelphia at that time, one doctor reported, quote, hundreds had spoken of dreams of being angels of mercy, but it got to the point where no one could be roused. The death rate got so high that there were families where every member was ill and the children began to starve because no one was healthy enough to give them food. Even as people heard of such need, they still held back, end quote. I think there are two groups of people that we know historically have responded well in medical crises. One is the healthcare workers. And the second group is those who believe to the core in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that they believe that they will be raised from the dead and have a life that is to come. They're all in believers in Jesus. They seem to be ones also that are willing to risk all to help others. In Kirkland, Washington, just one of the hot spots of this COVID-19 thing, the staff of hospitals have been showing the kind of compassion that health workers have historically um, in all the pandemics of the centuries. One of the healthcare executives there said this, quote, we have not had any issues with staff not wanting to continue coming in. We have had staff calling us and saying, if you need me, I'm available. Our baptismal creed claims that we believe in the resurrection of the dead and that we believe in the life of the world to come. It's this anticipation that prophetically causes us to snub the notion that our life is just in this world. And according to sacred texts, we're citizens of another place. Philippians 3, you recall, says, but our citizenship is in heaven. We are to anticipate a life beyond this one and not love this one that much. Being faithful to God embraces this. It, it, it causes us to live in anticipation of another life. And it's that anticipation that makes us be able to endure evil and to embrace sacrifice or even to experience things like the potential of death or martyrdom. Here's an example. 
that we have from thousands of them that come to us through the history of the church. This is from 1878. This is about, about 140 years ago. City of Memphis on the Mississippi River was struck by an epidemic of yellow fever. It killed so many people that the city lost its charter and took a number of years for them to even reorganize as a city as a result of this plague. Almost everyone who could afford to left the city and fled to higher ground away from the river, even though they didn't really understand it was caused by mosquitoes. Um, uh, people did notice when they were in dry areas and high areas that they felt more safe and it seemed that they were more safe. There were several communities of nuns, though, in Memphis, Anglican and Roman Catholic nuns, who decided, even though they had the opportunity to leave, they decided to stay and to take care of and to nurse the sick. Most of them, 38 in all, were themselves killed by the fever. One of the first to die was on September 9th of, 19, or of 1878. It was Mother uh, Constance, who was the head of the Anglican community of St. Mary. Why would they do that? <laughs> I mean, why would these ladies give their lives, risk their lives? At the core of making decisions like that is the notion that we have a life beyond this world. That not everything that is to have or to be had is had here. So here's what I'm saying. We're not meeting publicly this weekend as a church because we are afraid. We're meeting, we're not meeting because the love that we have for the good of the city. And it's not rooted in fear. Truth is, we're more afraid of <laughs> not having enough support financially by not meeting together more than we are of COVID-19 because that's the reality of it is when things start shutting down, people start getting desperate in terms of financial life. But here's the deal. A day may come when we may be asking folks to be willing to risk their lives for the good of the city, to serve, to be with the sick, to bring them Eucharist or to bring them food. Uh, the very thing that has driven us to take this extraordinary step of caution um, is the same thing that would make us risk our lives to serve folks should it come to that. Not everyone would do that, right? And God loves people even if they refuse to do such things. But some of us would do it. We're the body of Christ. We are citizens of another world. And our credo should always be for us to live as Christ and to die as gain. This is the story that's to give shape to our lives. And it's one that glorifies our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, there's a few housekeeping issues we need to talk about before I go. One is for the next two weeks through March 29th, we'll be meeting online. We'll assess that, let you know what's going on. Starting next week, we're going to be consecrating bread and wine as we pray over it live and want you to have your own bread and get your own wine and have it present with you as you're watching online uh, so that we can pray and consecrate that so you can partake of it at home. Um, we won't have any Wednesday night Eucharist uh, that will be offered, so, so be sure to bring your bread and wine when we view this online next week. Uh, all classes, youth group, uh, prayer meetings, small group meetings, all that stuff will either be canceled or be done uh, on, through some online platforms like Zoom. So we'll be watching your inbox for those of you that are participating in that. We want to encourage you to join us in prayer. We're thinking about possibly figuring out how to do that by Zoom at 10 a.m. On, uh, uh, on Monday through Thursday. If you're sick or if you're in trouble um, and you need some help uh, outside the medical zone, but you just like some help with something, whether it's um, to help you get food or whatever you need, please contact the office. Uh, we'll try to get someone to respond to you. Those of you facing that financial loss, let me urge you to continue trusting God and to uh, just, according to your faith, stay faithful with the things that you know you're responsible to do before God, including supporting the community of faith, including being engaged uh, in doing whatever you can, and know that even when things get tight, God will be there for you and will help you. Um, here's a beautiful uh, uh, encouragement from Catherine Marshall about this idea of God engaging with us in, in simple issues like financial or physical needs in some way. Here's what she writes. 
She says, quote, if we are to believe Jesus, uh, his father and our father, if we believe that he is God of all life and his caring and provision included a sheep herder's lost lamb, a falling sparrow, a sick child, the hunger pangs of a crowd of 4,000, the need for wine at a wedding feast, and the plight of professional fishermen who toiled all night and caught nothing. These vignettes scattered through the Gospels are like little patches of gold dust that say to us, no creaturely need is outside the scope or the range of prayer. Let me encourage you, have hope, and let's trust God. Friends, I want to invite you to stand wherever you are and let us together confess the faith that saves us. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. All right, it's offering time. Got the offering basket. Let's just give the Lord a big praise of the Lord here. For the <laughs> We're in revival. So I want to encourage you to go online to PushPay. The PushPay app, is it, Father Paul? Is that what it is? Find it. Check on our online portal. You should be able to see somewhere to give money. Here's all we're asking you to do is just give us all the money you can give us. And uh, let's be supportive of this whole season that we are not able to meet together personally. And uh, be blessed. Let God bless you. Trust him for your financial situation in this season. God bless. Good. I'm passing it. Friends, let's join our hearts and our faith together in the prayers of the people. God of living water, we gather together to drink from the deep well of eternal life. Fill us with your spirit so our thirst may be satisfied. Lord, we long for the unity of your church. Guide your people toward one another in love, charity, and truth. Bind us together in your spirit in order that we might be the visible body of your son in this world. May our lives and our example, with your help, display your care for all people, that we might see the world drawn into your unifying and healing life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You hear us calling, you hear us calling on the fire. Calling, you hear us calling, Abba Father. God of authority and power, we pray for those who have been granted authority and leadership in this world. May they embrace the vision of your kingdom, executing justice for the poor and the oppressed, resisting the draw into violence and vengeance, and embracing policies of equity for all people. As the fear of illness surrounds us all, we pray for those who have been given charge of managing this response to the coronavirus. Fill them with wisdom, Lord, for the safety and health of all of our neighbors. We also pray for the medical researchers. Grant them creativity and energy as they search for innovative medicines and immunizations. Lord, 
in your mercy, hear our prayer. You hear us calling, you hear us calling, I'm a father. You hear us calling, you hear us calling, I'm a father. God, our healer, we pray for those who are sick. Breathe your restoring life into their bodies and provide them comfort in their trouble. We pray for those who lack easy access to health care, for those who have weakened immune systems, for those who are anxious, for those whose income is being impacted, for children who will go without meals because they're missing school, for those who are caring for the sick. God, protect and help each one during this unstable season. Now let us name before our attentive God the concerns that weigh on each of us individually. Hear us, Father, and answer these requests according to your faithfulness and promises. All this we ask through Christ our Lord. Amen. our time together receive this benediction may the Lord bless you and keep you may the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you may the Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace go in peace sanctuary <laughs>